want to begin today by saying that um, Jesus is really coming. Amen. We're Seventh-day Adventists here, and uh, we believe and teach that Jesus is coming. Amen. And uh, some, somebody asked me the other day, what does Advent mean? It refers to the coming. The second advent, the second coming of Jesus. We believe that that's very soon. And with all the world falling down around us, we can have a renewed assurance that the prophecies are being fulfilled. That's what the prophecies are for. The Bible says, Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to what? His servants, the prophets, right? And the prophecies are becoming fulfilled very, very quickly. Let me ask you a question. Do you want Jesus to come? Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, of course, you don't, if you're not ready, right? That's a dangerous position to be in. But I, I, I just was just thrilled when I heard that response just now. Many choose to live life on their own terms, while others search the scriptures for, for the purpose of knowing Jesus and to be changed into his likeness. That is the preparation for the second coming. With, sure, with full assurance of salvation, I'd like to read. Sometimes people don't have that assurance. And I would like to invite you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Way near the end of the Bible, almost to Revelation. We should all have the assurance of salvation. And uh, with all these beautiful promises in the Bible, we, 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 we can't miss. Verses 11 to 14. And this is the record, that God hath given us eternal life, and, his, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may, what is the next word? Hello. That ye may know that ye have eternal life, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask. We know that we have the petitions that we are desired of him. So this is our first duty to know Jesus. Our first duty to know Jesus. It comes by looking. Let's go back to the book of Isaiah, the gospel prophet of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45, 22 and 25. Say amen if you have it. Isaiah 45, 22 and 25. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For, there's, for I am God, and there is none else. And verse 25. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified, and shall glory. In New Testament times, the seed of Israel is the church, right? Everybody who has their faith and trust in Jesus. Matthew 6, verse 33 says... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The gospel is outward looking. It's objective. That's what we mean to the word by objective. It's outward looking. Look and live. Look to Jesus. Look outside of yourself to the Savior. Spend some time every day searching the Bible for the purpose of doing what? Knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus, right? You know, the devils know, know all about him, and uh, they tremble when they think of it. But the people of God who put their faith and trust in him and who know him, there's a difference between knowing him and knowing about him. To know him, whom to know is eternal life. As Daniel uh, says in uh, Daniel chapter 12, as we run to and fro through the pages of the scripture, we can be assured that Jesus is real and uh, that, we, that we can know him. 
That's how we be ready for Jesus to come, to know Jesus. If we constantly look to ourselves, one of two bad things can happen. We don't want to look to ourselves. We want to look outwardly to Jesus. One of two things, bad things can happen. Either we like what we see when we look at ourselves, either we like what we see and we, and we, are, uh, we become selfish, important, proud, boastful, judgmental. How would you like to be in a church like that? <laughs> that comes from looking to ourselves. We need to be outward looking. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth. We don't want to become impatient with others. The other alternative, the other ditch that we can fall into is if we're not outward looking, the other ditch is to see a little good in ourselves and um, our feelings become dark and we get discouraged and even worse. We don't want that to happen either, right? So uh, to look to self is to look in the wrong place. So these are the two ditches of a subjective gospel that maybe some of us have had in the past, me included. That's what we want to avoid. The Bible says that without Jesus, we can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. Nothing is a very strong word. In fact, you can take all kinds of nothings. Nothing plus nothing equals what? Nothing. nothing. But God has great plans for us. I would like to read about those plans in Ephesians chapter 1. Great plans for us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. We all have it? Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. How many blessings? All. all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us. That's a powerful word. His desire is that all people be predestined to be saved, right? He wants everybody. He's not willing that any should perish. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. That's total acceptance. This should be our approach. It's based on God's promises that we are his children. All the promises of God are Yes, in him. You all know that one, don't you? First, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. All the promises of God are yes in him. We receive no blessings apart from him. That's why we should look to him every day. And then we should believe it. Notice from Romans, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I'm sorry, it's verse six, uh, chapter 6, not 5. Romans chapter 6. This is the baptism chapter, by the way. And if we look down to verse 11, Romans 6, verse 11, Likewise, reckon ye yourselves all to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What does it say there? Reckon yourselves. In other words, believe it, consider it, that in Christ you have acceptance with him. Another one, Romans 8, 15 to 19. I just love Romans 8. It's so assuring to us. 15 to 19. Romans chapter 8, 15 to 19. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father? That means dear Father. <laughs> it's a kind of a personal term. The Spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we shall also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth 
for the manifestation of the sons of God. When Jesus comes, we will be physically united to the heavenly family. You know, I read someplace that the family on earth and the family in heaven are one. We're here this morning, but in Ephesians chapter 2, it says we have the privilege even in the now to sit with him in heavenly places. Isn't that neat? Sit with him in heavenly places. God paid a high price to make this a reality. And uh, so let's look at about three texts here. Titus. Titus is a little book just before Hebrews. Titus chapter 2. Take all the comfort you can out of this. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus 2, verse 14. You see some are still looking. That's good. I like to hear the rustling of pages. Verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. That doesn't mean an odd people, but a peculiar, peculiar people, a special people. Unto himself, zealous of good works. Galatians 2.20. Some of you can quote this one. Galatians 2.20. This is the promise. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who, what does it say next? Loved me and gave himself for me. And Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, back just the page to the left. Galatians 1, verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father. This is a transaction. He gave himself for us. And all he has done is for us. You can read about that in Hebrews 9 verse 24. He did all of this for us. Who pays for something and doesn't want it? Certainly not God. He paid it all. We never brought anything to the table. So he bought us for a reason. We don't have anything to offer except our gratitude and our thanksgiving and our love as we bring obedience to him. The question is, what does God want to do for us? There must be a reason. I want to read Ephesians 1 verse 4 again. This is what he wants to do. Ephesians 1 verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him. No guilt here, right? Some of us maybe have suffered with guilt. No guilt here. Uh, that's a description of life. That's, that's the only way to live. He wants to make us so that we can live with him forever. Follow him wherever he goes. The promise to Laodicea is an important one. Revelation chapter 3. Laodicea is that last church just before Jesus comes. And notice what he has in store for all of the overcomers in Laodicea. You know, the Bible says they overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their what? Testimony, you know that, that verse in Revelation chapter 12. Well, here in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Anybody wrap your mind around that one? I, it's it's uh, almost hard to even think about. It rem reminds me of Psalm 16, verse 11. In thy presence is the fullness of what? Joy. And with him are pleasures forevermore. That's what he wants to do for us. That's his plan for us, fullness of joy. Do you know God has faith in us? Oftentimes we say, well, have faith in Jesus, right? But God has faith in us. That's if I, if I, that if I be lifted up, I will be able to draw all men unto me. As we see him, we love him. God believes that this will happen if we'll only look. To know him is to love him. Let me ask you, do you believe that he can do that? It's all involved in our, in our looking. 
and putting, putting our attention in the right place. His, he has faith that we'll look. Jesus must have wondered at times, as he saw the people around him, as he ministered so unselfishly, he must have wondered at times, is there anybody that, could, that really gets it? It was very discouraging in the day that they took him away from the judgment hall to the cross. The disciples all forsook him and fled, except for John. He stayed at the foot of the cross. People were crying, crucify him, crucify him on every hand. Can any of them get this? He looked hopefully one night into the eyes of Nicodemus. He often communed with people one to one, one on one seeking after each one. We might call it seeking love. Before sin, sin entered, he didn't have to seek after created beings. Seeking love was never needed before. It never needed to be demonstrated before the fall, of our, of our, uh, the fall of, into sin. Never needed to be demonstrated before, even though it was there all the time. But Adam and Eve sinned, and he sought after them in the garden. He said, Adam, Eve, where are you? Seeking after them, seeking love. And Adam and Eve didn't come running to him. In fact, the Bible says that there's none that seek after him. But God seeks. Romans 3 says, there are not any that seek after him. Not any of us without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. By the way, we should pray for Holy Spirit to come into our lives every day, right? Yes. So that we will seek after him. That's, this is what the human condition is like. But Holy Spirit comes and gives us desire. Else we wouldn't do any better than Adam and Eve did. It is the Holy Spirit who points us in the right direction. I'd like to have us turn to John, the 16th chapter, where it talks about, about uh, the Holy Spirit's work. This is his primary principal work. It's all for us, remember? Chapter 16, starting with verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into what? All, all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Now Jesus is speaking here. He shall glorify me and he shall receive of mine and, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he should take of mine and show it to you. Jesus is the great, or the Holy Spirit is the great shower of Jesus. Uh, we are told to look, look and live, right? That was the, the that was the, the the instruction out there in the wilderness when the fiery serpents were biting all the people. People were the dead and dying were all, all around. Moses was told to put a, make a brazen serpent, put it high on a pole, and have bid the people to look, the outward look. And that serpent represented Jesus who became sin for us, who knew no sin. He was willing to go to the ultimate limit here. So the Holy Spirit is the great shower of Jesus. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then what? All these things will be added unto you. He first seeks us, and the Holy Spirit shows us. We become seekers, seekers as we behold the goodness of God, which leads us to repentance and conviction of sin. Ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with your whole heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. Eyes are the organs of seeking. Jesus must have wondered if anyone would seek after him. It was difficult to find anyone who had genuine faith. And there the Lord of glory was right in their midst. Then one day, Mary broke an alabaster box. You remember reading about that? Mary broke an alabaster box a whole year's wages. And the people in the room challenged her, wasteful. Even the disciples were criticizing her. Look, <laughs> they looked down on her. Don't people know who she is? But Jesus saw someone who was seeking righteousness. 
Oh, how it must have thrilled him that somebody could get it. He saw something genuine in the heart of this, of this, of this uh, woman. Somebody could get it. Almost like Abraham when he takes Isaac up the mountain, Mount Moriah, the very same spot where Jesus would many years later be crucified. That somebody could get it. Jesus would have paid the ultimate price for just one of them. Now he was satisfied. If Mary can get it, then maybe a whole lot of people, others, could get it as well. Her life was in shambles. But Jesus saw here a candidate for his kingdom, one who desired her better, better good. He knew now that if she could get it, perhaps many more would come. And Jesus said, wherever the gospel is taught, tell the story of Mary, because she's an example of, people, of someone who gets it, really gets it. It's kind of like, uh, we, once we get it, we need to stay with it, right? You all have read, ridden a bicycle, haven't you? Maybe even the children here have ridden a bicycle. <laughs> it's easier to keep that bicycle upright if you're moving, right? What happens if it stops? Well, you've got a problem on your hand. So he's always there for our encouragement. Uh, Matthew 10, 22 says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Present continuous tense. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. And that's so important in Matthew 10, 22, that he repeats it again in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. He gives us this endurance. Endurance really in the old English is the word patience. Revelation 14, 12, we all know that verse, don't we? Here is the patience of the saints. Here's how it reads literally. Here is the steadfast endurance of the holy ones. Those who keep God's commandments in the faith of Jesus. Let me ask you. Has God made a good investment? <laughs> we need to take that personally, right? He paid the infinite price. Do you think you're valuable to him? The cost of the blood of Jesus is the value of every one of us in his sight. What could keep him from his goal? What could possibly keep him from saving us? You know what? He'll take nothing from us that we don't want to give up. On the other hand, he only wants us to give up that, that which will ultimately kill us. That's how much he loves us. So let us close this little section of our program today with a beautiful passage from Romans chapter 8, verses 29, 28 to 39. the assurance that he will take care of us. Romans chapter 8, 28 to 39. Romans 8, 28 to 39. Long passage. Take all the comfort we can out of it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom also he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather he that risen is risen again 
who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes the intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> 